Hello, and welcome to the seventh lecture in the Asian Development Bank 3IE Impact Evaluation Video Lecture Series. This lecture will look at different evaluation designs which can be used to evaluate the impact of infrastructure projects. The first question we'll ask ourselves is, is randomization possible? Can we randomly assign the location of infrastructure investments? And the answer is, yes, we can. In many cases, we can randomly assign infrastructure interventions. Take the example of off-grid rural rectification. Solar home systems, for example, can be randomised at the household level or the community level, whereas other off-grid interventions, such as microhydro, can be randomised at the community level. A second example, urban development. Slum upgrading can be randomised at the household level if we're improving the quality of housing for slum dwellers, or at the community level if we're improving the quality of the environment in individual settlements. And in the case of water supply and sanitation, again we can randomise the individual household level if we're assigning latrines, or allocating water supply, or rehabilitating water supply, or at the community level, again for connecting to mainline water. Even large-scale infrastructure investments can be subject to random assignment. Take the example of rural electrification. Here we've seen the main distribution line, a number of sublines going off it to connect villages 5 to 10 kilometres from the main distribution line. To take one example, there are two villages which might be connected to the grid via this extension of the distribution. What we do for a random assignment is to match these two villages into a single pair and we conduct what's called a matched pair randomization where we randomly select one of these two villages to be connected to the grid. We can see similar pairs along each of the different extensions of the grid and we match each of those pairs and then randomly select one of them in each case to be connected to the grid. This is what we call a pipeline design because we are connecting one of each pair to the grid for now but in the future we'll also extend the grid to the second village in each pair. That's an example of a randomised rollout where we've randomised the rollout that is the order in which different eligible communities get access to the infrastructure. We can imagine other examples of using randomised rollout for infrastructure investments. Take the example of rural roads. We have a large program of reconstructing and rehabilitating new rural roads, say 50 to 60 of them, then we can randomise the order in which we do it. Similarly, if we're rehabilitating a piped water system, we can randomise the order in which that rehabilitation takes place. And finally, with an irrigation system, we can imagine we could randomise the order of the construction of secondary or certainly tertiary canals. We can also use randomised control trials to examine policy reform. Here are two examples of studies funded by 3IE. The first is a new system of pollution auditing in Gujarat and India, where it was shown that the random assignment of independent auditors improved the quality of reporting, the reports were more accurate, and also reduced levels of pollution. Now, that's not an infrastructure example, but we can well imagine applying similar principles and conducting a similar evaluation to, for example, inspection of construction quality of trunk roads. A second example, also from India, looked at the impact of agricultural water pricing on production and yields for paddy crops in West Bengal and resulted in reform of those policies. We can also use what's called an encouragement design. Everyone gets exposed to the intervention. Everyone has access to the infrastructure. So the random assignment is of the encouragement to use the infrastructure, not of the treatment itself. We don't randomly assign the infrastructure itself. The encouragement we use must not affect the outcomes we're interested in. So common encouragements are things like information on the benefits of using the infrastructure or some incentive to do so. So for example, if we randomly assigned a subsidy for the connection charge to the grid, that would be an example where we could use an encouragement design. It's not always possible to conduct a randomised control trial for infrastructure, maybe because the study is being done ex post, so there was no random assignment, or maybe there are political or administrative constraints in doing so. In that case, we can use non-experimental designs. We can virtually always use propensity score matching in one form or other, 
or if there's some threshold eligibility for some subsidy to access infrastructure, say on uh, electricity and the connection charge, then we can use regression to continuity design. When we are using non-experimental approaches, it is very preferable to use double differences or difference in differences to get a more accurate estimate of impact as explained in the first lecture in this series. Take an example of irrigation. Here we see the main canal and three secondary canals running off it. The number of villages lying along those secondary canals which are going to be connected to the irrigation system. Where we get our comparison group from? We can't get it from the other side of the canal because that's a hilly area with a different ecosystem so the villages there won't be comparable. So instead we can look at villages a bit further away from the main canal. We did a study like this in Andhra Pradesh in India where we used villages that were to be connected to the canal in the future as the secondary canals got extended. So it's an example of a pipeline design. But we went another step further and used propensity score matching to establish a region of common support. That is, we made sure that the villages that we included in our comparison group were sufficiently similar to the villages in our treatment group. And so we dropped villages from the sample that proved to be too dissimilar. Establishing common support in this way ensures balance between your treatment group and your comparison group, meaning they have on average the same characteristics. Let's see an example of that from the analysis of demographic and health survey data to look at the impact of improved water supply in Nepal. The table shows in the left-hand column some of the variables which are correlates of access to clean water and in the bottom row the outcome variable of child diarrhoea. As we see from the middle column, the characteristics of households with access to clean water, the treatment group, and those without access, the comparison group, are really quite dissimilar. For example, nearly half of all households with access to clean water are in the top quintile, whereas only 2% of households without access are in the top quintile. So when we see in the bottom row a difference in child diarrhoea prevalence between the treatment group and comparison group, we can't attribute that difference to access to clean water because these two groups are very dissimilar. But when we carry out propensity score matching and establish region of common support, then as shown in the final column, the two groups now are really very similar. Roughly a third of each group live in rural areas, roughly a third of each group are in the top wealth quintile, and 17% of each group, the household head, has higher education. So the average characteristics of these two groups are now the same. So when we see this difference in child diary outcomes now, we can attribute that difference to the intervention, access to clean water, because the other characteristics of the two groups are on average the same. Of course, infrastructure impact evaluation designs may not be as strong as we would like, and we should use various means to strengthen or buttress those designs. A main one is triangulation, first by using alternative impact estimates from different sources, and then by looking at qualitative data for verification of the estimates we're getting. We should also use a theory of change to think about who benefits and how, as shown in this example here, and analyse that causal chain. So, for example, we construct a new bridge, there are direct beneficiaries who use the infrastructure themselves to seek employment or go to take goods to market, but they're indirect beneficiaries from increased demand for their goods and increased availability and lower prices of consumer goods in their area. So, for the example of entrepreneurial irrigation I mentioned earlier, we triangulated the study by not only using our own impact estimates, we also used existing data looking at crop production patterns and yields in irrigated and non-irrigated mandals in the districts in the command area of the irrigation system. And we also did a similar analysis using data from the baseline report where we had conducted a survey in those areas. We also sought expert opinion on crop production and yields in irrigated and unirrigated areas in the command area. In addition, we did causal chain analysis, which emphasised the importance of construction delays in reducing the rate of return to the investment, but also the importance of interrupted or insufficient water, particularly the tail ends of the secondary canals, which meant that the benefits of access to irrigation were considerably less than had been estimated at the time of appraisal. Finally, what about large-scale investments like ports or trunk roads? It may be that the impact question is not the most important question. A very important question in these cases is actually about the quality of construction and the cost of construction. Having said that, you will at the time of appraisal have made estimates of the benefits of the project and so you can ex post 
use impact evaluation thinking to think through and better calibrate those benefits. Use causal chain analysis and use counterfactual thinking to move beyond before versus after analysis what the benefits have been. So make by the best available method estimates of counterfactual traffic volumes, import levels, vehicle operating costs and so on. Large scale investments of this kind will have regional or possibly national macro effects with production and consumption multipliers, which cannot be captured by the sort of large end statistical analysis that we've been discussing in this lecture series. In that case, you will also need to use computable general equilibrium models to do analysis to capture the full impact of the investment. So in summary, randomization is often possible. You can randomize the intervention itself, you can randomize analysis of a related policy issue, and you can use randomization in the encouragement design. Where randomization cannot be done, then non-experimental methods are often available to conduct an impact evaluation, though those designs may be weaker than we'd like, in which case we need to buttress them through triangulation and good causal chain analysis. These same principles can be used to analyze the impact of large-scale infrastructure investments. So in conclusion, in one line, it is possible to do rigorous impact evaluation of large-scale infrastructure investments and other infrastructure investments. And I hope this talk has helped your thinking in how you'll do that on your own, in your own work. Thank you.